Assalamu alaikum and a very warm welcome to Perspective. I'm Tayyaba Nisar Khan bringing you some significant topics such as the election, the general elections 2024 are happening on February the 8th and of course the entire country is involved in what's going to happen and how it's going to happen as well. Many important political developments are also happening in that fact as well, uh, such as of course the rallies that are being taking place, the political uh, show that has been taking place right now in Faisalabad we saw PMLN showing a political uh, force that they saw and not just that, also we've seen PVP going in Malakand, uh, all of them starting from Balochistan of course and of course in February the 8th there are many many other issues that are happening as well, many important and significant contests that we're seeing as well in different areas in Multan, we've seen Mehrbano Qureshi uh, versus Ali Musa Gilani and of course Nawaz Sharif's uh, coming back as well to power is also on the line over here uh, with the important battles that are happening as well. Now of course uh, this election is very significant for multiple reasons. Pakistan's um, no, no prime minister has survived a full term yet and we're going to see if that will happen or not but not just that but also very important uh, happenings have been happening in fact such as the security situation in Pakistan uh, where of course we've seen about 500 rather 1500 attacks uh, terrorist and militant attacks that have happened in Pakistan in 2023 alone the security situation has been worsening but uh, of course the most important one over here is the economic situation where we've seen in past two years Pakistan's PKR has dropped to its lowest and we've also seen that the country was on the verge of default multiple times as well after the IMF bailout package we received 1.5 billion recently as well uh, we've seen that uh, the economic situation has become a little stable right now and the caretaker government is doing all it can to ensure the stability of the uh, economic situation in Pakistan as well we've got rollovers happening from China and so UAE as well uh, but will Will this suffice and will this stability continue? And this is the biggest question that of course the politicians and the party that wins the election will have and they will have to maintain the political stability as well, uh, the economic stability of course as well and the security question that has been happening. We've seen Afghanistan's uh, spat with Pakistan taking place as well. Just a recent report by the UNSC suggests that about eight Training camps of Al-Qaeda have opened up in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan is directly impacted by any security lapse in Afghanistan. We've already got PTTP in the play. We've already got ISK in the play. We've already got BLA and BLF in the play. And now, of course, Al-Qaeda is rising its head as well. And of course, not just that, we've got uh, Iran and Pakistan's recent spat as well and how BLF uh, and BLA are, of course, targeting the Pakistani nationals within Iran. So a lot of foreign policy, economic challenges, and not just that, but also social welfare challenges as well. Youth has been the center of m many political debates that have been happening, not just by PPP, who is being spearheaded, his election campaign is being spearheaded, by Bilal Bhutto Zardari, who himself is a youth, by the way. He's about 35 years of age, and uh, his political campaign has been highlighting the impact of youth and how the uh, economic uplifting is going to take place and how he's going to ensure job opportunities as well. But also PMLN is targeting the youth as well and ensuring that their manifesto has the, uh, of course, the, the uh, employment opportunities available as well. They're talking about Pakistan ko nawaz do, which is a political slogan that they're uh, raising and not just that PPP's manifesto is highlighting uh, chuno nai soch ko. So they're trying to bring this anew. And of course, in the era of IT and technology rising as well and all the uh, foreign policy issues that are related with IT uh, rising as well. We also have to see how this new dimension is going to be dealt by the other political parties uh, or any, any specific political party in fact and especially those who are going to win uh, the elections as well. So it's a debate going on. The elections are just around the corner. Do go out and vote as well. But of course, very important is to read the election manifestos, have a comparative analysis and then figure out which political candidate supports the ideology that you support and then exercise the right to vote as well. But ladies and gentlemen, the second segment, we're going to talk about the very significant security challenges to the election that might happen as well. Of course, there was a report where we saw 6,531 polling stations are uh, deemed sensitive in Sindh alone. And IB and ISI have plans to ensure the security over there. We've seen three 
tiers of security, the police personnel, then the rangers, and of course the Pakistan Armed Forces who have been given this charge of ensuring the security as well. But we've also seen that the security forces have been targeted by TTP in the past few months in Bajor as well. We see a political candidate uh, being targeted and killed uh, in Bajor, Rehan Zeb Khan as well. And so this, this is having, this is actually showing many multiple faces and many multiple colors of how this election is becoming very significant and also security wise very important as well we will of course discuss on that as well but of course we have been joined by our guests on today's topic regarding the general elections 2024 we have mr irfan Ghari, political analyst he has joined us in the studio thank you so much for joining us we also have online Mr. Niaz Murtaza, who's also a political analyst. He is joining us via Skype. Thank you so much for joining us as well. Uh, now, of course, uh, Mr. Niaz Murtaza, I'm going to go to you first. We've seen that economic situation has come up as the most significant uh, situation and the most significant topic for all of the political parties to address as well. We have seen the stability growing under the caretaker government setup and a lot of uh, structural adjustments being taken place as well regarding that. Uh, do you think the political party that comes in charge is going to take it as seriously as it should be taken? Well, I mean, you know, that's the big question. Of course, the last two or three years have been bad very economically and as you rightly mentioned you know uh, the economic problems have also been joined by the problems of insecurity especially you know the terrorism issues in the border areas uh, kp and uh, balochistan and uh, what we've had in the last one uh, six months is that you know we've had an unelected government which doesn't have to worry about you know popular sentiment so much so it's been able to you know take some unpopular decisions like, uh, uh, you know, raising uh, petrol prices, raising electricity prices as required by the IMF. And that's held, uh, you know, the rupee uh, stable around 280 for a while now. But then, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously its hands are tied. It's not, you know, an elected government. It has, you know, severe restrictions on the kind of, uh, you know, far reaching long term decisions uh, that it can take. And it was very apparent that, you know, it tried to restructure FPR and the ECP stopped it from that. Even PIE's privatization, it could not go ahead with that. So all that is going to come to fruition under the new government. And, you know, whichever uh, party wins will not have much time or much fiscal space to, you know, give any relief to the people who've been waiting for relief and they'll be hoping that now that they have an elected government, uh, the, uh, the new government will be able to give them relief. But, you know, there's just no space for the government to do that. So that will be the big challenge. And right away, we will have to go into a fairly tough IMF program, which may last for three years, so which that means for the first three years, at least of this government, there won't be much fiscal space to give much relief to the people. So that will be the real challenge. And for that, we need, you know, a strong government with a strong mandate. But, you know, that's looking more and more unlikely. Uh, uh, if you look at, you know, some of the opinion polls that are coming out, they suggest, you know, a, a hung a parliament where no party will have, a, you know, a strong mandate. And then there are all the issues and questions raised by uh, PTI about the level playing field, etc. So if the new government is weak and then, you know, its uh, mandate is, you know, called into question, then the issue is how will it be able to deal with the economic challenges as well as the security challenges? So, uh, you know, it will require all its creativity and, uh, you know, uh, uh, capacity to be able to deal with these problems. So what one can only hope is that, you know, uh, the elections deliver a strong government with the right mandate to be able to deal with these problems. Right, the right mandate is very significant to be able to deal with this problem, and especially the very significant problem, of course, the three-year pro program, uh, which could, of course, go on till three years. The IMF program is very significant, very stringent as well, and the any new government that comes will have to take very difficult uh, decisions as well. Uh, Mr. Irfan Ghari, let's, let's come to you now. Of course, we know that there has been a lot of talk about electables in Punjab, in uh, South Punjab specifically by PMLN as well, and uh, not just that, in other areas as well. PPP uh, is also looking 
trending towards electables in Punjab region. We've seen the contest in Punjab <coughs> is very significant, and not just that, but Karachi is also very significant. Uh, so, do you think electables hold a very significant, um, a very significant position in this particular election? Uh, thank you very much, Taiba. Uh, the electables in our political history that has been, you know, uh, they have been. Uh, playing a very important role and that is what we have been seeing in these elections as well that these political parties uh, they are uh, trying to uh, to get as much electables as they can because we have a uh, we have a social system where which is based on a patronage you know uh, it's a patronage based system where those people uh, who we consider electables uh, they matter and they know the art of winning the elections. One is the party vote, which is in some, you know, in, 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 in um, uh, the, the urban areas, we have a good party votes. But when it comes to the rural areas, the dynamics are totally different. And in rural areas, still these uh, electables, they matter. And their vote plus the party vote, that is how they turn into seats. So, what we have been seeing uh, in the last uh, election that there were many new faces that have come uh, and this time as well uh, one of the parties PTI uh, maybe because of the because of so many deser uh, uh, desertions mm. that uh, uh, they have fielded almost 50 percent more than 50 percent new faces but right. when it comes to the uh, other two main uh, mainstream parties people's part Pakistan people's party and PML and most of their candidates, they are the ones which are not the new faces and many of them are the electables, what right. we call them the electables, yeah. Right, of course, we've also seen a lot of uh, speculation, rather some very uh, significant statements that have come out as well regarding mm -hmm. the seat adjustment formulas mm -hmm. with PMLQ and with JUIF and of course with mm -hmm. e Pakistan party as well with PMLN, specifically relating to Punjab as well. Mm -hmm. So um, do you think these seat adjustments are happening? And of course, what do you <coughs> think uh, regarding the legality of these? Uh, Taiba, we have a very multi-party system. You would know that uh, more than 100 parties, I think 137, I don't know the exact number, which are, you know, which are approved by the Election Commission of Pakistan and many of them, they are con contesting. And when it comes to such a contest and in a, uh, and as on average, this on, in, in this election, on average, in, in every constituency, you would see like 18, 20 candidates, they are, con uh, they, they are contesting. And in such a situation, uh, these uh, the political parties they they make these arrangements where they have seat ad adjustments, and some of the seat adjustments are are quite strange. That uh, um, ideolo ideologically, one party is totally again you know opposite to the other party, but when it comes to their local politics, they make such ad adjustments. And also, I think this is one um, one of the reasons is that. Uh, uh, since none of the parties is uh, in a position or mm. it sees itself in a position that they can single-handedly, uh, they have such a popularity that they can single-handedly, uh, they can contest the elections and make the, the maximum numbers. Because when it comes to the outcome of the election, mm. uh, mm, every, you know, the, uh, every party they want to have the, their representation, but the main contenders they they always want that at least they can have you know the numbers with which they can form the, their own government but if they can't in that case of course it's a hung parliament and they need coalition mm. um, partners but um, you know even um, to 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 secure that number they make such adjustments so that you know like you mentioned about P pmlq mm. pmlns um, uh, seat adjustments with the pmlq then in jui then with the ipp so these adjustments are based where give and take in one mm. constituency you are supporting right. their candidate and the other constituency they are supporting your candidate so this is how it is working because we don't have a two party system which we see in many developed mm. uh, countries so in such a situation this is uh, very normal Right. Uh, Mr. Irfan, before going to Mr. Niaz Murtaza, I want to ask you a simple question. Do you see any simple majority happening uh, in these elections? It will, of course, depend on, you know, the election outcome, but as far as those... Uh, 
What's your foresight? The projection, yeah, uh, they, they are showing it's, uh, it's, it, it seems very difficult. And in this parliament, what we are expecting is that a lot of independents, they would right. be coming. And those independents, one of the reasons is that uh, a major political party, PTI, it is, it is not, uh, it cannot uh, contest on its own symbol. So their candidates, back candidates, they are also contesting as independent. Then there right. are many other candidates. So the in independents would have uh, uh, very, uh, you would say, crucial role hmm. uh, in case any of the main parties, if they couldn't get a simple majority. Right. Independents will have a crucial role uh, to get a simple majority for any party. Mr. Niaz Murtaza, we've seen a, a recent press conference just an hour ago by Babar, uh, Akbaris Babar, and he also talked about a very in interesting issue. Of course, the intra-party elections, he said, of PTI were not correct. And he also said that uh, the elections which were hap meant to happen on 5th of Feb are now, go now going to happen after the 8th of Feb elections. So what is the use of these intra-party elections now if they're going to happen after the election itself? Well, you know, intra-party elections in Pakistan are a bit of a joke. You know, almost all parties except uh, uh, jamaat e islami hold sham intra-party elections. It's the same with PTI, with PMLN, with PPP. If you look at, you know, do some Google searches, what you find is, you know, the same thing with PMLN. It was sent, you know, repeated uh, uh, notices by ECP. And then in the end, you know, they announced their result and everybody got elected unopposed. Now, there was no action against uh, a PMLN for the, uh, that kind of a thing. But, you know, PTI, which has held elections twice, you know, they singled out uh, PTI. And the fact is that, you know, the rules around uh, uh, intra-party elections don't exist in Pakistan. All that is expected from the parties that they'll submit, uh, you know, an uh, election certificate. If they don't submit an election certificate, the uh, ECP has the right to, you know, deprive them of an election symbol. But nowhere does it say that, you know, the election commission has the right to, you know, look at the legality, the validity of those elections. And that's true even in India. So for the election commission to suddenly give itself those kind of laws, uh, rules and powers, it was very strange. So, you know, I, I mean... Uh, it doesn't mean that what uh, the parties do uh, is right, but then, you know, there should be an even-handed uh, 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 treatment for all the parties rather than just singling out one uh, that has fallen out of uh, favor. So it's going to have a huge impact, the fact that, you know, a, a PTI can't put up its independent, its own candidates, they have to run as independent, so they will not be, uh, you know, subject to the uh, uh, party loyalty clauses that we have in our constitution, which say that if you're elected on a party ticket, you can't, uh, you know, abandon the party in certain uh, votes, including, you know, the election of the prime minister, no, uh, 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 no confidence vote, etc. So now they'll be open to poaching from other parties. So that's going to create a lot of, you know, a, a sort of horse trading you have about three weeks before the parliament is called in after the elections to take oath. And that will, three weeks will be, you know, time for every party to try to poach those independents through, you know, threats, inducements, etc. And uh, the thing is, this is what all that, you know, PMLN especially has been focusing on. You know, they released their manifesto just a week before the election and all their energy for the last two, three months was on, uh, you know, collecting as many electables and these smaller parties as they could, forming alliances with them. So uh, there'll be a weak government. It will, uh, its mandate will be questionable. And then, you know, it doesn't have any ideas on, uh, you know, how it's going to deal with this huge economic crisis. If you look at its manifesto, it's all bland. There isn't even a mention that, you know, Pakistan is facing a huge economic crisis. And uh, nowhere does it say how it's going to deal with this crisis, how it's going to get us out of the IMF, uh, you know, uh, net. So it doesn't look very, you know, elections are supposed to serve, you know, a rejuvenating uh, uh, process uh, uh, for a nation to, you know, uh, new ideas are presented by different parties and the one that is able to convince people wins and then comes with a strong mandate and then, you know, applies those ideas. But there's going to be none of that. And uh, so it's just hard to see, you know, what 
impact these elections will have, what you know, momentum they will create for the massive changes that Pakistan is waiting to happen in economic, political, security, foreign policy areas. Right. Uh, we're just talking about the security aspect of the elections as well. We have been joined by Dr. Maria Sultan as well online with us. Uh, Dr. Maria, welcome to the show. We've seen that significantly Thank right now. Uh, the security angle is very significant because we've seen attacks on not just rallies, but also the killing of an individual, an independent candidate, Mr. Rehan Zeb Khan from NA8 Bajor as well. And this was a very shocking sort of incident as well. And not just that, but many other incidents such as the, um, the, the fact that sensitivity has been shown in about 6,000 uh, polling stations, 6,500 polling stations in Sindh, in Balochistan, in KPK as well. There, there has been a lot of security lapses that are um, seen and of course a lot of this, this speculation on the security aspect in the elections as well. Uh, what do you think after the three-tier security that we've seen, what do you think is going to be the situation on the election day in itself? Uh, will we be able to curb the security threats? Well, of course, this is going to be a major issue, and this is one of the major reasons that the armed forces would be coming in the aid of civil power and would be performing these duties um, according to the constitutional article of Article 245. Uh, in addition to this, we do anticipate um, heightened um, heightened threat, security threats, but we are hopeful that despite all of this, uh, the elections will be held in time and uh, the quick response force would be able to mitigate any threat as and when it, you know, uh, emanates. Right. The elections will be held in time. Of course, we've seen the elections being postponed in Bajor. Um, how can we ensure that there is security of the candidates, especially in these sensitive areas, is maintained? Right, Dr. Mario Sultan, can you hear us? I'm so, yes, I'm sorry. Could you repeat that question again? I just lost how it for a ensure, second. Right, right. How can we ensure the security of the candidates of the elections is ensured right now? Because, of course, we've seen a, a killing as well, not just that, but we've seen the postponing of the election in itself in NA8 and Bajor in itself. So how can we ensure the security of the candidates? Well, I think in this case it is extremely important and pertinent that um, all the candidates who are standing for elections stand uh, very in stand in close connection with the civil administration and uh, remain cognizant of the fact that there are security threats and there are legitimate security threats. That's number one. Number two, they need to take necessary precautions. And number three, we need to consider the fact that there are personal and you know animosities as well, which are at play. And then in in addition to this, then we have non-state actors. As well. So these are things which require that candidates uh, do take care of their security and do take this responsibility because it's not just about their security, it's also about the security of other people who are participating in the election process. So it's, it's a combined effort and it means that they need to remain um, in constant contact with the uh, civil uh, law enforcement agencies and hopefully uh, they come through the election process in time and according to the need, uh, which is to maintain stability, and most importantly, to have a very seamless political transition, which is required. Right, of course, you talked about the security of not just the independent and as well as the political candidates for the elections as well, but also the people who are going to turn out and vote. Uh, democracy talks about free and fair election. If the people don't turn out, if there isn't much voter turnout, uh, it's going to impact on the democratic value of free and fair as well. Uh, so how can we ensure the security of especially the sensitive areas? Has there been an action taken regarding that? For the well, according to, well as, as of now, of course, the quick reaction force is there. And then, of course, as whenever there is a high-level threat, whether it is from emanating from terrorism or because of political issues, uh, necessary uh, steps are taken by the law enforcement and the paramilitary forces. Similar steps would be taken in this case as well. But more than that, it's a combined process in which, um, of course, the people will be the ultimate litmus test in terms of how seriously do they look at their security, how far is the turnout. And most importantly, what is the political atmosphere? Although there will be incidences uh, here and there, and there is always going to be high threat areas and low threat areas, but on um, you know on the average, what we are anticipating is that this, that this political process will be seamless and the transition will happen as and how it is anticipated uh, in the realm of political transition. 
Right, the Interior Minister has uh, recently given a statement as well that the government is going to ensure the security situation during the elections as well. And of course, we've seen in the past that TTP has targeted specifically uh, the security forces in itself. Uh, so, of course, making that uh, sure uh, the, the security of the security personnel in itself is very, very significant as well. Uh, and the law and order situation also concerns that. Uh, Dr. Maria, in your experience as a security analyst, any recommendations or solutions that you present towards uh, this rising growth of terrorism and how to curb uh, that effect? Well, I think first and foremost, what is extremely important is to understand that the first line of defense against terrorism are always the people. We need to remain vigilant, not just about the terrorists, but also about the aiders, the facilitators, and those people who would benefit from creating political instability in the country. So that's first and foremost. Secondly, we need to understand that we must know there are helplines. Number three, once there is any kind of a situation, there should be enough space given to the law enforcement agencies. Plus, uh, last but not least, also the first responders. Because if you are not going to aid and facilitate your paramilitary forces, then any kind of a security situation becomes extremely impossible to handle. And then furthermore, once there is a threat, we need to consider that very, 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 uh, you know, with a, with a lot of, uh, uh, you know, I would say, uh, with, with, with a lot of uh, patience and with an understanding that at this moment, we are dealing with a lot of external pressures. We are dealing with countries uh, which do not want Pakistan to be politically stable, do not want this transition to happen seamlessly. And of course, there are vested interests. So in this case, it's extremely important that we take our political rights, our political freedom, and most importantly, um, our right to choose and move forward seriously. So if we follow the precautions, follow the things and the steps which are given by uh, the Election Commission of Pakistan, in addition to that, the civil administration, hopefully the transition would be good. But if it's not, then of course there are going to be threats. And then last but not least, I think it's extremely important for the political candidates as well that they do not use violence as a measure of change. And acceptability at the end of the day will be the ultimate test in which we will see whether the political transition has happened as and according to the rules. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Maria Sultan, right before we bid you goodbye and thank you for joining us, uh, there's the last question. Of course, security dynamic is very significant in these elections as well because we've seen that a lot of threat uh, is coming not just from Afghanistan but also from Iran as well. We've seen the escalation of uh, violence and not just that but also the strategic instability that was caused due to the action as well. So what is the uh, election candidate, whoever wins, whichever party wins, what are the first few steps that they need to ensure after coming into power? Well, I think the first thing which we need to do is to have a serious, uh, you know, conversation on counterterrorism efforts and take the necessary legal steps which are required so that we are able to mitigate these threats effectively and foremostly with, with full force. Because it is not acceptable that every time we go through a transition, every time we go through a different period, uh, that our people's lives are at put at stake. I think this needs to come to an end. Pakistan has been suffering terrorism for the last 20 years. We cannot, we cannot foresee our country living another 20 years of terrorism as, as a major threat of real. Whatever the international global geopolitics are, it's extremely important that we value the lives of the people of Pakistan. And that basically means that the people of Pakistan also have to understand that it's not a war against, it's a war within, which needs to be fought only and only if we understand that it's not about us, but it's also about the others who want to destabilize us. Hence, right. take this seriously, make the necessary steps, work with the law enforcement agencies, and hopefully your country will be stronger and smoother uh, when it deals with a politically stable situation in the future. Right, thank you so much for joining us and giving your analysis, Dr. Maria Sultan. We were talking about the security situation, not just during the elections, but of course the steps that the political candidates can take after the elections. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, we're going to go back towards the debate, uh, the political aspect of the debate as well, of the elections that were um, going to happen on February the 8th as well. We've talked to Dr. Uh, Niaz Murtaza, and not just that, but we were talking to uh, Mr. Irfan Ghari as well. Uh, Mr. Irfan Ghari, let's talk about uh, the, the horse trading that we've already talked about. You also mentioned it, Mr. Niaz Murtaza also <coughs> mentioned horse trading as well. Uh, so, of course, horse trading has been very, very important in not in just the previous uh, decades and the previous elections as well, in the previous uh, parliamentary process as well, but of course it's going to be important right now. Uh, do you think there's any way that we can take a legal action against those uh, who horse trade? 
Taiba, this horse trading thing, it's, uh, it starts, you know, when you have, uh, especially when you have lots of uh, independents in, in, in your uh, parliament. Uh, sometimes we see defections from the parties, but the laws and uh, the, the interpretation of the laws by the courts, it's now difficult that a person who is elected from a platform of a party and if they switch their loyalties, then the law takes action. But if somebody is elected independently and uh, under the, you know, the, the existing laws after the election, once the elections, the election, uh, results, the unofficial el uh, results are announced, there will be 14, 13, 14 days uh, 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 between which the, uh, 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 the political parties, I mean the, the ones who have, uh, who have, uh, who have turned as a successful uh, people, they would be submitting their election expenses and these things. And after that, election commission would notify them as uh, officially as as winners. So this would be a, a time uh, that these political parties they can you know they can accost to the independents and they will try if there is they need the numbers that they would try and they would try to convince and maybe they would try to buy the loyalties of these independents. Then uh, under the laws once this notification is issued official notification of uh, results is issued. After that, they, there is another window of three days where the end independents, they, ha they can decide which party they would be going to. So uh, this will be a, a tough task for especially for PTI because uh, those who would be, you know, uh, getting elected, uh, they would be using parties popularity and parties narrative and the pa parties uh, uh, backing. But once they are elected, it will be very difficult. That's why we have seen that uh, their party chairman, he was taking oath on Quran -e Park. So this shows that um, they are seriously worried about it. And also, once these, uh, you know, it's, once this parliament uh, is, you know, it, it comes to, you know, in existence, yeah. uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the parliamentary leader now uh, under the, the, the new laws, the parliamentary leader is the one who decides. So if your leader is sitting outside the parliament, he might have say on party matters, but the parliamentary party on the matters of parliamentary party means the members of the party, it is mm -hmm. the parliamentary leader. So this is also important that though who would be the parliamentary leader of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, of PTI in, in parliament. Right. So that would be a test for the candidates mainly from uh, PTI who would be turning up as independents. Right, that would be a test for the candidates of PTI. Uh, but of course, we've seen this process going on for a long time. It has been polluting the politics of Pakistan, the horse trading, uh, not of course the independent candidates going to different parties. Uh, but let's talk about the election manifestos, Irfan. Uh, we've seen that the election manifestos of PPP and the PMLN, it came out very late. We've, on, we've only seen the election manifesto, the full uh, 20 plus pages election manifesto coming out about uh, two weeks, two and mm. a half weeks before the elections are set to take place as well. Um, and there's not much time for <coughs> multiple voters, the entire 240 million population of Pakistan to read those man election manifestos and debate on them because we haven't seen them come out before that. So uh, how, how can we ensure that this process of debates and the significance of the election manifestos is actually ensured uh, in the future elections, if not this, uh, in this election? Uh, Taiba, it's not only the manifestos that have come late, but what we see is that most of the manifestos, they lack the the Content. solutions actually. Hmm. I mean, saying something, we will be creating these millions of jobs. That is easy thing, but how would you create them? Hmm. Saying that we will address the inflation which is 29 percent which is unprecedented since mm. 1952 i think this is the highest inflation that we have been facing and that inflation has broken the you know back of uh, common men so there there doesn't seem any solution with them mm. similarly on issues of environment similarly on issues of uh, population growth uh, the security issues, hmm. what we see is, you know, most of the points, they are common, but we don't see the substance where the solution, I there should be some solution, there should be some mechanism how they would be addressing. And the serious challenge is that 
you know in pakistan we need at least 7% growth for consecutively for uh, two to three decades to get i mean uh, our economy back and get out of these troubles and that doesn't seem uh, you know possible uh, the current years i mean the ongoing years forecast is 2.2% uh, i guess which is you know very less and this is the this is the least i think in the region and with IMF program, as Nyasa was also, also mentioning, that with IMF program uh, with us, I don't think there would be much space uh, for, th for any government. So uh, after the elections, making of government is one aspect, but once the government is formed, addressing the issues of the people, that is real test uh, of, of our politicians and mm. the system. And then also we need serious reforms in our mm. system, which uh, also includes that our judicial system, our bureaucratic system, they all are still running on the colonial, you know, uh, era's uh, uh, precedence. Yeah. So, all these have to be, uh, they have to be, you know, modified according to the needs of the present day. Yeah. But we don't think that, we don't see that any of these parties, they have come up with some solid plan where we can have a um, uh, way out to address all these issues. Right. We, we need to still see solid plans and not just uh, promises because, of course, we, can not, um, we, we can't really see the promise happening unless we know the clear pathway towards that promise as well. Mr. Niaz Murtaza, let's go towards you. Um, we've seen that Bilabal Bhutto Zardari, he's talked about how he wants to avoid a politics of hate and he wants to go towards a constructive politics as well. He does not want to uh, fight among the political parties and have a consensus regarding certain issues. Uh, do you think in Pakistan we can see in the near future the, uh, the absence of politics of hate? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's good, uh, you know, the kind of divisive politics that we've had for the last three or four years where, where you know, it was just like, a scorched earth tactics being used and not even recognizing your uh, opponents as you know uh, uh, competitors to power but you know basically seeing them as enemies and you know uh, just uh, saying that they don't even have the right to exist uh, politically that kind of politics has been very bad and to that extent uh, it's good that you know Bilawal doesn't use that uh, one uh, once in a while he also goes off track and you know he also engages in these kind of you know attacks personal attacks uh, but uh, then you know on other occasions you do see him act maturely but then you know that's just the start what we uh, need is you know solid ideas and the ability to you know translate those ideas into action so he's you know carrying the message that he's young he's fresh uh, and he's a new face but you know uh, it's not just enough to have a new face. We need new ideas, and then we need, a, you know, a team to implement those ideas. And that's where, you know, my uh, questions are about, you know, Bilawal and People's Party. They've been ruling since uh, for the last 15 years, and we don't see, you know, a very imaginative new kind of governance where it would give you hope that, you know, if the same party is elected at the national level, it will do something very different. And uh, unfortunately, that's uh, true for, you know, the other two uh, main parties as well, PMLN and PTI. PTI, of course, is facing so many problems. It's barely functioning as a party because of the unfair crackdown on it. But, uh, you know, uh, uh, look at PMLN. Uh, you know, it doesn't have uh, any new ideas. Uh, even it's, you know, new generation of leaders who are also young. You know, they uh, use the same kind of rhetoric that their elders do. So that is the issue that we have, you know, there might be the rhetoric of, you know, new kind of politics, but, you know, the kind of, you know, imaginative uh, ideas and action that we require, you don't see that capacity in any of our major parties. But then, you know, that's a fact, you know, one of them is going to get elected. So we can't be, you know, dreamers and start hoping that, you know, certainly angels will descend. Uh, so one of these parties is going to, you know, uh, win. And, and then, you know, the only option is that, you know, somehow they realize the gravity of the situation and instead of, you know, appointing their old tired faces who failed so many times, especially for the prime minister's position, uh, 
uh, you know, they, uh, we should look at, you know, how the Congress party behaved after Rajiv's death instead of, you know, the uh, uh, Gandhi party uh, taking over the prime ministership. They appointed competent prime ministers, Narasma Rao, Manmohan Singh, and they oversaw, you know, India's transition into the superpower that it has become economic superpower. So that's what we need for, you know, these top party leaders to, you know, make some sacrifices, make way for new people, let them run the party, the Sharifs, the Zardaris, but they should appoint a competent prime minister and a competent cabinet that can grapple with the, you know, the huge challenges that we are facing and then give it all the political cover that it needs, the political support to take the tough decisions that can be, uh, uh, that can help Pakistan come out of this crisis, just like India in 1991. So that's what we need. Right. Uh, Mr. Niaz Murtaza, you actually spoke about the, the topic which I was going to lead you towards as well. They've, they've seen that World Economic Forum and the World Bank is uh, pro foreseeing that India by 2030 is going to become one of the fastest growing economies in the world. And of course, it's also focusing a lot on tech with elections in India coming up as well. There is this uh, India factor which we have in the debate. Of course, the politicians, whichever political party comes into power, it will have to deal with that factor as well. In April, their elections are coming up. There might be another Balakot sort of situation if they uh, they truly commit towards uh, their own political policy that, been, that they've been going uh, taking on. And of course, we saw in the last elections, they, as a political campaign against Pakistan to win the elections, uh, Modi, Modi carried out the ballot code sort of attacks as well. So there's a security threat from India that we can see. So any political party that comes, what, how can they, they, they basically navigate their relations with India. Both PPP and PMLN have said that they would want to establish better relations with India, but how can they navigate that? Yeah, I mean, that's going to be one big uh, challenge and it's quite a coincidence that three or four major South Asian countries are having elections one after another. Bangladesh just had one, now Pakistan and then India. And what you see is, you know, you were talking about the politics of hate, and that's what BJP is all about. You know, it's politics of hate against Muslims and other minorities. But then, you know, despite that, there is also the fact that they've been able to manage the economy fairly well. Uh, you know, uh, just picking uh, from where, you know, Manmohan Singh left, uh, it's not that uh, the Indian economy has, you know, suffered under BJP's politics of hatred. Uh, yeah, the economy continues to do well. Uh, so yes, that, that that is one area where, you know, I would say uh, the PMLN and Nawaz Sharif have uh, some sort of an edge. They do have some rapport uh, with, the, you know, Modi, the way we saw, you know, Modi visiting Pakistan under Nawaz Sharif. Uh, 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 so, you know, that's uh, one area where, you know, the PMLN could probably, you know, pro provide an edge. But then, you know, it doesn't mean that for that Nawaz Sharif has to be prime minister. He could manage that as president of Pakistan or president of, uh, you know, even PMLN. But the important thing is that, you know, we need, uh, you know, uh, economic experts, governance experts who can take, you know, cue from the way India was turned around in 1991. We have the same kind of, you know, economic meltdown, uh, in fact, worse than what India had in 1991. So, and then, you know, the economic burden that we carry has a lot to do with, you know, our enmity with India, the high uh, tensions that it creates, and the fact that, you know, there's a heavy uh, defense expenditure for both countries. And then the fact that, you know, we are getting shut out uh, because India has such a huge uh, clout uh, internationally that people prefer to have relations with India rather than Pakistan. And if you see this, you know, new... Uh, uh, corridor uh, that was talked about in these large uh, conferences that we had in India a while back, you know, these G20 conference that India hosted and then this new economic corridor that was uh, uh, mentioned. You know, it, it's a, it has a very tortuous uh, path. Uh, you know, the straight path would have been uh, pa uh, India, Pakistan, Iran, Turkey, and then Europe. But because of, you know, the bad relationships that uh, Pakistan has with India and then Iran with 
the rest of the world you know takes a very circuitous route through you know the sea and then back to uae and then again sea so that's the loss that we are occurring we are shutting getting shut out of all these new coalitions economic coalitions that are being formed so yes you know having good terms uh, and conditions with uh, ties with india would be an important challenge right it would be an important challenge but also ensuring that the security factor remains intact as well and of course not just that but the tech space and of course uh, the the environmental space is very significant mr niaz murtaza you were talking about how important it is for us to have new ideas and the new ideas is to ensure that there's more talk about tech there's more talk about it there's more talk about climate related policies more talk about environmental related policies more talk about youth related policies as well seeing that youth is about 70% uh, of pakistan's uh, pakistan's population as well and not just that but also bringing out minorities and a gender balance as well in the election campaign of course we've seen that the ecp has said that we need at least the representation of 5% of women for the uh, parties political parties they need to nominate 5% of the women which is what has actually built on to the representation of women in the national assembly seats as well instead of just the um, uh, quota seats but we do of course need more ideas and bring out more youth and women in the election uh, campaigns and of course in the their own uh, coming as the independent or political party candidates as well for the national assembly seats uh, thank you so much for joining us mr niaz murtaza and of course thank you so much for joining us mr irfan wari thank you to ms maria sultan as well who joined us earlier to give a comment regarding the security situation as well uh, ladies and gentlemen this is all for now kindly watch the perspective tomorrow as well take care allah hafiz